This is the current federal tax developments for the week of December the 11th, 2023. Current federal tax developments are brought to you by your State Society of CPAs and by Kaplan Financial Education. I'm Ed Zollers, and I'm broadcasting this week again after getting back to Phoenix from being on the road this week. And we're going to talk about a few things that happened during the week. Some of those included the IRS announced they have sent out a batch of over $20,000 $20,000 to say, 20,000 employee retention credit rejection letters to those that had filed claims for refund. And we'll talk about how they selected that 20,000. And uh, just to give you a little advance notice, this is truly the low hanging fruit that they're going after on these rejection letters initially. Uh, I think you're relatively safe to believe that your clients are not getting one of these letters unless the IRS made an entry mistake in putting in the claims for refund, or you've got a client that's way less honest than you probably want to be associated with, so you might want to fire such client, but that's a whole other question. Also, we have separately an employer filed suit claiming the IRS ERC guidance violated the Administrative Procedures Act. Now, we'll talk a little bit about that suit, the nature of what they're claiming, but then also the weird side effect that they're not actually asking for a refund at this point, which is uh, interesting considering that they've had an IRS rejection of their claim. And while I don't claim to absolutely understand in terms of from an attorney's perspective exactly what filing this suit does to their ability to continue to attempt to dispute, I assume they still could file a second suit within the two-year period, and argue the basically the validity of their claim, but it's kind of an interesting issue that they specifically are not seeking a ruling on the validity of their claim at this point. So it was kind of an unusual issue. We're talking about third, we have the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the Moore case. Now we talked about the Moore case before. It is a case that is officially about the 965 transition tax and that only but it does have the potential for spillover defects depending upon how the case could be decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And so we'll talk a bit about that, uh, seeing how it goes. We did have an interesting aside, as I'll discuss there, that wasn't a whole lot of time spent in the oral arguments, to be totally honest, or at least from the justices' questions, regarding the specifics of the 965 transition tax, except to try to figure out how in the world it could be different from the other taxes, which at least the plaintiff was claiming it was different then. So we'll kind of get into that background. Finally, we'll take a look at the draft K2 and K3 instructions that were published by the IRS. They're finally out. And we'll discuss the fact there's no major changes to the domestic filing exception for 2023 compared to what we did in 2022. So the first thing I want to talk about this week is an IRS news release, news release 2023-230, issued on December the 6th. It was entitled, IRS Expands Work on Aggressive Employee Retention Credit Claims, 20,000 Disallowance Letters Being Mailed, More Action and Voluntary Disclosure Program Coming. So the IRS announced the agency is sending out more than 20,000 rejection letters on ERC claims that had been submitted to the agency. Now, as I noted in the introduction, this is really low-hanging fruit. We're not talking about uh, letters for things that are you know, where there's probably much question that at least assuming the IRS didn't foul up the entry of the paper 941X, assuming it went in as it should have, and assuming that all other things were processed by the agency, this should be our fairly straightforward. So I think the vast majority of these are very, very straightforward rejections, but they are clearly low-hanging fruit, so they're not going to help us much in determining whether or not a particular client that you have that actually doesn't have these two problems, whether their claims are valid or not. So the first group that will be part of this are entities that simply did not exist during the periods for the ERC claims they're filing. So obviously an entity that did, was not formed until 2022 would have difficulty qualifying for the ERC since they didn't exist during any period that they could have been impacted by this. or entities that simply had no employees during that period. Now, I'm presuming from that the IRS is looking at to see whether any 941s ever filed for this entity. And we already had a case that went badly 
for a promoter early on in the program that was going out and rounding up Schedule C businesses and having them file for the owner. That, that one went very, very badly and long, you know, that was quite a while back. Presumably, we may have cases like that where people continue to try to round up Schedule C businesses and have them file for the owner. So we may still have some of those out there. So just over 20,000, they claim, of such claims are out there uh, between the two categories there. As I said, clearly, those are low-hanging fruit. I doubt that anyone's going to suggest that in either of those cases, if you didn't exist at all, or, or you had no employees, even if you did exist during those periods, that there's any way you could qualify for the employee retention credit. So again, that's not telling us much of anything in terms of being terribly helpful, except that there were some really bad claims out there. So we got that much going down. Um, the affected employers could still challenge the IRS denial in court. As I said, that, that could happen because the service got it wrong. You know, there are entry errors. They could very well have, you know, fouled up the entering of the EIN. The employer could have fouled up something like the EIN. So there are various reasons why there could be, and I figure there are some of these that really are not the problem the service thinks they are, and those could still be challenged. Again, generally, when you file a claim for refund, you have two years after a formal IRS administrative denial to file your claim in the U.S. tax court. Now, I should point out the other way you can get in tax, not tax court, say, but U.S. District Court. The other way you could get there, or I should probably add court of claims as well, uh, is if it takes more than six months. If the IRS has been sitting on your claim for more than six months, then you can force the issue into the courts. Now, generally, you would probably aren't going to want to do that, even though a lot of these have been sitting for more than six months, because challenging in court is a much more expensive proposition. And that's going to, and it may not necessarily make things happen any faster at the end of the day, because, you know, court involves a whole bunch of different things that will probably make it not a terribly quick process. So presumably most people are going to wait till they get the up or down from the IRS, at which point they're going to either go forward and say, hey, we're going to take you to court, or they'll give up and say, okay, we tried, uh, you know, we're not going to actually do a court challenge at this point. Now, the IRS also states, which was another, which was probably the most useful piece of information here, that they are going to release a voluntary disclosure programs for those who received her payments. Remember, we already had the withdrawal program if they either hadn't sent you the check yet or you hadn't cashed the check. We're still missing the program for those that cashed the check, but now are thinking, hey, ugh. you know, I don't think we qualify and want to try to get some way to you know, get themselves out of potential messes for penalties and that sort of issues, or even potential, you know, concern, concerns by CID and the like regarding their claim. So that voluntary disclosure program, they now are giving us a date. They are saying it'll be out by the end of this month, which means essentially next three weeks, right? In the next three weeks, we should see that program. How long it'll run? And how generous it'll be, those are both still things that are very, very much open to question. I think the real, real question, I think the real one that was a problem, as you may remember back when we talked about the hearing, you know, among the Ways and Means Oversight Committee, hearing that we had, or subcommittee, I should say, that we talked about a number of weeks back, the real problem that came up at that hearing was, you know, what do you do about the fact that these people have paid a 25% fee to a promoter? many cases, uh, which, you know, they don't have the money to pay that back and not necessarily a really good chance the IRS can get that money from the promoter. It's going to be very messy. And either they may have trouble prevailing because of the agreements the promoters had with the clients that at least on paper attempt to move responsibility for the, uh, for basically for the claim and whether they qualified for the credit on to the client. But on top of that, there is even the question about whether or not the, even if it got a judgment against the promoters in some cases, whether some of them, if they had a number of clients that they did flaky claims for, you know, whether or not they even could recover that, right? Could the government get that money back or could the client get the money back, which is the question. So 
the discussion of how much leeway should they give there, that's going to get into the whole question about, you know, well, what, are you punishing employers who didn't fall for this, you know, easy money theory? Or are you, you know, but the alternative is, did, did you just have gullible employers, you know, who paid that out and legitimately thought that, you know, the, these promoters were right? And are we going to put them out of business? That's an interesting and messy thing. I have no idea how it's going to come out. But it is something that we know, and a, and a, at least the IRS is saying, before the end of this month, we are going to have this program in play. Next up, we have a lawsuit. Southern California Emergency Medicine, Inc. versus Warfel. This, this is a complaint filed in the U.S. United States District Court for the Central District of California. Uh, you know, it was their complaint and exhibits. It's case number 5, colon, 23, CV, 02450. And the complaint was filed on December 1st of 2023. Now, we have links in the materials for this week. You know, if you get, go online or you get them uh, through your state society, you know, the, uh, basically the materials that we have that show citations and the like. And what's interesting there is if you go there, I'm referring you to the Tax Notes Today research site, which is available for free and has a lot of useful stuff on it. Now, the text on the web page is solely the complaint. But in addition to that, if, if you go on the options, you'll see there on the page is a little PDF icon. And if you click that, then you'll get the PDF, and that will give you not only the complaint, but a couple hundred pages of basically exhibits attached to the complaint. And two of the exhibits are the actual IRS letters or the IRS, you know, notices that outline the denial of their claim and specifically what the IRS has problems with in the denial. Now, I find that to be interesting reading. And frankly, this particular claim, at least based on what the IRS is telling us, um, is not a totally out there in left field flaky theory that some of them are that really had, didn't even identify a, a, an order, missed a lot of details, etc. This one is a little more interesting, and that's why I got very disappointed they're not asking for the refund. The reason being, this would allow us to see us, and I don't know if it's going to be quick enough anyway, given the short time frame before statutes expire, certainly for 2020 filings, potentially for 21. But it would be nice to see a trial on the merits of some of the positions outlined in this, you know, by this taxpayer. But that's not quite where we're going right now. Let's talk about where this case runs. Now, the IRS had denied the ERC refund claim for all six quarters for the medical employer. It appears that they had one set of claims filed for the employer's operations in California and a second set of claims for their operations in Arizona. So we had two sets of claims there and they denied them all. So, okay, taxpayer has now submitted their claim for refund. IRS says they said, okay, we determined, we looked at your stuff. Sorry, you don't qualify. You don't get it. That would start a two-year period during which the taxpayer can file suit and attempt to get their refund, right? They've now gone through the administrative process. The IRS said no. So now that, that gives them their ticket into the courts, right? They want to go there. So it's kind of interesting. Now, one of the things key here, and this is what's going to come up with what this actual case is looking at, is the IRS denial is outlined examination report cited in those 2021-20 along with other references. Some of the other references were to the code, to the CARES Act, uh, you know, places like that. I don't know that any other IRS notice got cited. I didn't see that scanning quickly through the, uh, through the two reports. But notice 2021-20, if you're not aware of what that is, that is the key ruling regarding the employee retention credit. And it covers most of the details of what does and doesn't qualify in the view of the IRS as partial, full or partial suspension of a taxpayer's business operations due to a government order related to COVID-19. And uh, that's, that's the background. And that's the key thing we're looking at here. Although they're, what they're asking for in terms of relief would actually cover not only that notice, but the other notices that were issued by the IRS, 2021-45 being the other big one. So, you know, that, that's the background you're looking at there. Now, the complaint argues that the IRS should have been required to follow the Administrative Procedures Act 
uh, procedures before issuing this guidance. That would require a public exposure and comment period prior to these, the guidance being issued by the service. Now, we should point out that had that happened, it would have definitely taken much longer to get the guidance. But the, tax, but the taxpayer does point out that you know, the IRS has had now three years, so they could have issued the notice, followed up with, let's say, regulations, and then had the regs. And yeah, probably in three years, they could have gotten that whole process done. Although we know that in some cases, you know, regulation projects have languished around for quite a bit of time. And so in any event, that's where we stand. Now, what happened here is they asked that the IRS be enjoined from enforcing Notice 2021 in any administrative or judicial forum and be enjoined from requiring compliance with the illegally imposed obligations under Notice 2021-20. Well, probably, yeah, the IRS never could do something with illegally imposed obligations. So I, I think we're clear there that that would probably be something the service could not do. But they do, you know, that's, that's what this is asking for. I'm a little confused at this point about if they win, then what happens? Because it would seem like the IRS, even without the notice, would argue from the code. So it seems like all you're doing is taking the references to notice 2120 out of there, but then just substituting the full IRS analysis that would argue that would end up at the same position in the notice. So I don't see ultimately that this goes back to exam. And an exam comes back and says, hey, you know what? You're fine. You're good. I have a feeling they're just going to come back ruling the same way, which is the reason why it's a little interesting. We're not asking for our refund at this point, right? Same sort of thing. And requiring compliance with this notice, I assume that, you know, it, it's tough to know their difference there, except I think that second one is meant to say that agents aren't allowed to deal with it, right? Because um, it seems like in requiring compliance, and this is also just a little weird because this is all in the context of not an original 941, but rather a claim for refund, which also makes it a little bit unique comparatively, right? It is a claim for refund, not an original. That's also a little different because we have had Administrative Procedure Act cases, APA cases, um, you know, here recently. But the couple of cases that we've had, one at the Supreme Court, one at the Sixth Circuit, Neither one had really dealt with refund style cases. One of them dealt with the question of whether or not, you know, where it was for promoters of tax shelters and certain IRS guidance issued there and whether the IRS had to comply with the Administrative Procedures Act. And there, as the Supreme Court noted, well, look, you know, we, we, the IRS is saying, well, you know, they should have waited until you can't get pre-enforcement guidance or pre-enforcement court challenges. And the Supreme Court did point out in that case, well, that seems a little extreme here because the only way that they could have, because the question was, did they have to register as a tax shelter promoter? And as the uh, Supreme Court pointed out in a unanimous decision, um, well, the only way they, they could have gone with the IRS and waited till post-enforcement was to not file, wait for the service to come in and charge them and the problem is, this is also a potential criminal charge. So, you know, the idea being, well, no, you know, you know, you can't really go down that path. They said that that would be unfair. You know, the there, there's no uh, there's no other reasonable relief than for them to get a pre-filing challenge. Similarly, the second candidate was one that came out of the Sixth Circuit, where we had a case where the it was found that uh, when we talked about the listed transaction reporting rules were passed by Congress in 2004. Congress in 2004 said that if you failed to report on information return, uh, you know, that you participate in a listed transaction as the IRS had them defined, that, you know, by their various notices, that you were subject to the terribly, horribly nasty penalties. And there the Sixth Circuit found that for anything added to the list after the date of the after the law came into effect, well, that was a legislative and not an interpretive regulation. The idea being that, you know, they were actually, these things were not illegal until they added them. I have a little trouble getting either of those cases to fit this fact pattern very well. You know, 
it seems to me that if there's ever been an interpretive set of rules, it's these notices. They are clearly interpretive. Uh, the ERC, you know, outlines rules, and we might say the definitions are not totally, absolutely clear, but that's not something that's unusual in the tax law, right? You know, the courts are going to have to kind of come up with what, what are the reasonable lines for what's considered a partial suspension of business operations due to an order from COVID-19. There are various clauses inside of there that you would have to deal with. And you also deal with the question of the use of particular words. And I've always been concerned about the suspension word because that, that seems much, much more serious than modification or restriction. You know, suspension is seems like halting something entirely. And, you know, was there a halt to a significant portion of the taxpayer's business? That would seem to me to be the most straightforward definition of a partial suspension is a partial halt of we had to stop doing something, right? That would be my just plain language interpretation of partial suspension. Uh, but the IRS offered these various guides. But the reality is they're just the IRS's opinion. As I've always said, that's all they are. And I don't see why, you know, how they could enforce, you know, unless you're just saying that the IRS is barred from taking that position or even arguing that the law says their position in the notice is correct uh, because they issued the notice and never did the other thing. So you're telling me the IRS would have been better off to have left everything open, not told anybody what the rules were, and then come back into court and, you know, argue this position. So they've been better off not telling anybody anything, which... I'm not sure we're going to get there, but it'll be interesting to follow anyway. As I said, does not ask for a refund, nor does it argue for the correctness of their position on the ERC. That, to me, is very disappointing um, because I would really would like to see these things run. Now, if you want my own bet, I don't think most of those positions are going to hold up. You know, But they were not the totally out-of-left field positions that we've seen in some cases. They, they have a little more meat on their bones. And, you know, I, I think they at least have a chance to see, you know, it, it might be a bit of, you know, swinging for the fences and seeing what happens, but it would be nice to know if the courts are going to consider the swinging for the fences options. And it would have been nice to do that and have that go to the Court of Appeals. And we could all hope that somehow we could get this resolved at least in time that we would have some answers before December, before we get to April 15th of 2025, uh, when we run into the deadline for basically filing claims for 2022 or for 2021, which let's remember that that was the larger set of refunds. Potentially, if you could qualify for all three quarters, that could get you up to 21,000 per employees. So yeah, the problem is it doesn't look like we're going to go to trial on those issues here, which hopefully somebody else takes something to trial. We'll hope for that for the best. And the real issue we got right now is not clear, not clear quickly not clear to say how quickly any ruling will come down. And we would expect any result against the government at least to be appealed up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So I'm just not comfortable that even if there is something taxpayer friendly out of this, that we will know it in time to make decisions for filing claims for refund. But understand this is out there. I certainly suggest you take a look at the, at the complaint. You take a look at the sample IRS exam notices for no other reason than it's, it's good to see a real notice, you know, see what did they do. Obviously, parts are redacted uh, to, you know, not, not to reveal confidential stuff about the taxpayer in this case. And, you know, it was a taxpayer filing them. So, you know, we, we, we will assume that the taxpayer, you know, you know basically they, they kind of knew we need to keep some stuff quiet because we don't want to disclose stuff we don't have to. So you might want to take a look at that, at least get a feel for that. And we'll keep our eye on this case. But again, I don't know it's going to help us much for what we need help on right now. Okay. Um, you know, like I said, not, not clear for this. And I really don't know, as I said, what full relief is. It's kind of interesting to see once they get to court, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure a judge is going to ask up front, okay, what exactly do you mean by your request? What, what specifically do you see happening in your case if I would say, hey, you know what, you're 100% right. They should have used the APA procedures. They failed to do so. Uh, what exactly happens from this point forward? You know, what exactly happens? Because I don't, I'm not sure I know what you mean by that. 
you know, are you telling me the IRS has just given up the right to assert any position that has been made in the notice? They can't come back and argue from the code or the code or the, or, you know, their bill in this case, the CARES Act or the code uh, for the later part of the ERC. You know, what exactly is the point? And th that's what makes this one a little interesting. This week also we had the United States Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the case of Moore versus United States, case number 22-800. We had a transcript of the oral argument that was posted on December 5th of 2023, along with the oral arguments, right? So, so we've got that issue, right? We actually have the oral arguments themselves that, that were put into, you know, that, that are there. You can actually listen to them. It's about two hours. Now, the oral arguments were heard, as I said this week, on a case, it was challenging the 965 transition tax. We've discussed this before. A tax imposed in 27 to 2018 by a taxpayer who held a 10% or greater interest in certain foreign corporations, had certain types of earnings that were held offshore, had not been brought back onshore, repatriated, and they we were transitioning from a you know, from basically a worldwide to a territorial tax regime that primarily benefited uh, corporations, and they were the primary ones paying on this scheme. But individuals got mixed up in it too, even though they really didn't get a huge benefit of the few changes. But we'll talk about that. In any case, this case involved in a pair of, you know, basically a couple, right, in this case. Now, they had argued the 16th Amendment, which was what got us the income tax, the Constitution, requires that income must be realized to be taxed, and that the 965 transition tax was on income that did not meet this test. This income in the 965 transition tax, you know, test was income, right, that had been recognized by the, you know, let's say, recognized by the taxpayer or recognized by the corporation offshore, but the IRS can't tax that. The U.S. can't directly tax that. Rather, what happened in those cases previously was that that would be held offshore and only if it was paid out later, only the extent that money came out later or they sold their interest, would the U.S. then turn around and impose a tax on the shareholders, in this case, the Moors. Now, that would mean that prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you only paid that tax when money came to you. Now we're going to this catch-up clause, and then we're going to go ahead, and from this point forward, we change to a somewhat different system, although not very much for these people, but that's a whole other mess. Into that one, individuals are a bit weird on the add-on. Now, one thing that confused me a little bit was, was why the Taxpayers' Council hadn't anticipated what happened almost instantly. Almost immediately, and, and you find this almost always, you know, the, the Supreme Court, they call on the Plaintiffs' Council to present his case. So he goes up there, and virtually, almost instantly after they start talking, you know, they'll start presenting a case, you know, they'll start presenting an argument, but almost instantly, one or more of the judges, justices, will speak up and start putting the questions will start being posed. And this case was somewhat unusual because Justice Thomas, who doesn't speak often in oral arguments, immediately asked the taxpayers' counsel for what's probably the key question. Okay, you're, you're, you're saying that the, you know, it must be realized. Oh, okay, assuming we mean that, assuming we, we accept your point, what exactly is your definition of realized? And this became crucial because as this case advanced, the problem is if realization means I receive cash, I have to receive cash effectively or something of that sort, then we get into a case where it seems odd about weight. Virtually every flow through entity is a problem now because if you cannot impose a tax until you know, money is received. And in fact, the, uh, basically the solicitor general who's arguing this on behalf of the government, you know, she was pointing out a case from this, that Supreme Court had heard years ago that talked about a partnership where the partner literally could not get a distribution. There was no way they were going to get a distribution, but they still had to pick up the flow through income. 
And so the problem becomes trying to reconcile all of the history of jurisprudence back from the original, you know, 1916 income tax, uh, you know, the amendment, I think it was 16 when it came in, uh, through today, including a number of things where we tax like S corporations, partnerships, the, uh, you know, the subpart F, which includes 965, but they're arguing that the rest of it's fine, right? And I never quite felt comfortable as to why the rest was fine, except I think, as a lot of the justices said, it might be the key difference is, you know, when we look at a due process question, because you're taxing all of that previously held back income, you know, at, at one point in time, which, pre, you know, which you had kind of had that promise it would be only when you took it out. So, you know, can they really change that retroactively? But that they said, but that's not really a question of whether you can tax the income. It's more a question of whether, you know, this particular law violated due process, isn't it? And clearly they don't want to go there. Um, I, I think the main reason they don't want to go there uh, is because there are, in, there, there's a lot of suggestion, I think almost everybody knows this, that, you know, th th this case is kind of a backdoor approach to try to get a Supreme Court decision that would foreclose Congress from passing any sort of wealth tax. I happen to think the chance of a wealth tax passing at this point in time is pretty much nil. And even though we have certain people talk about it, there's a long distance between Congress people talking about something and actually being able to get it done. And that's really key difference when it's relatively controversial and the, you know, the divisions in each house are very, very close. Because again, we're going to need 60 votes in the Senate to get this to a rule to a vote normally you could try it i guess through a reconciliation package but then again the democrats don't control the house and you know it would only seem to work if they got the house senate and presidency and even then i don't know they have enough democrats to pass it so now we need a really big number of democrats you know being elected to get a huge majority in the house and senate you know, and control the presidency, and then maybe, yeah, but it still seems iffy. I'm, I'm not sure it has that great a chance of going through. But there's enough concern that's been talked about that there was, you know, uh, some people felt they wanted this and that, that wanted this decided, and this case offered a mechanism to maybe get it by concentrating on the realization rule, right, if it exists. Now, as I said, the plaintiffs did concede the receipt of cash is not required for realization, and also specifically that subpart F uh, is not unconstitutional. I think that, that was a key issue for the discussion. However, as I said, they seem to struggle trying to explain why subpart F as a whole was okay, but this particular thing wasn't, as well as why it's okay to tax a partnership, you know, flow through income, even given the history of the case where you had a, uh, you know, a partnership that was you know, you know, essentially it was assured you weren't getting the money. But that, 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 was, a, that, that was a pretty uh, interesting discussion. But similarly, you know, they, they were concerned too about the impact of saying that it appears there was no limits. Everything could be income. You know, Section 61 certainly reads that way. You know, was that really what the 16th Amendment meant? So they were very, very much concerned about that. You know, and they're looking at the old McComber case. Yeah. McCumber case, right? And the the catch is even if the justices conceded that that McCumber made broad broad indications that income must be realized, but over time the Supreme Court seems to have whittled that down in other precedent over the entire Internal Revenue Code period, and it would seem to be majorly disruptive. My take is the court is looking to make a narrow ruling, which could actually disappoint everybody. Uh, pretty quickly because I, I, I think, you know, at, and it quite often, I will be totally honest, one thing that tends, the courts don't tend to like quite often is trying to be forced to rule on a matter not before them, have a matter before them that where the party, at least, you know, one or more of the parties are seeking a ruling that would cover a theoretical transaction or hypothetical law that doesn't yet exist or hypothetical transaction that's not before the court. So my own guess, which is difficult to do, because it's always dangerous to speculate based on oral arguments because 
let's just put it this way. It's very tough to tell why exactly justices are asking the questions they do. Does that really indicate their position? Are they just, you know, are, are, are they trying to find the limits, you know, and say, no, 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 I, I don't really believe what my question would suggest, I believe, but rather I'm just trying to see how solid the counter argument might be by bringing it out and getting discussion, you know, on the table about this matter. So lots of reasons to why things go the way they do. But yeah, but my take, if I had to do it the same one I had when this was filed, is I'm expecting a narrow decision. It is possible they find the 965 transition tax illegal. Um, I'm If I had to bet, which is a really bad thing to do because I'm really bad at this, if I had to bet, I'd probably suggest the more likely outcome is they find that realization is required. That gets rid of that language they didn't like from the Ninth Circuit. But then they hold that there was realization in this case, likely by the corporation, you were given a deferral. We've just shortened the deferral. That's okay. That's not a problem. And cover it like that and leave totally open whether the wealth tax, because as was pointed out a couple of times here, and the justices also pointed this out, was, well, in, in this case, the corporation already realized the gain. Now, in a wealth tax, there would be an argument there had been realization. That said, remember, we have things like mark to market for commodities contracts. And that also, you know, you can argue there's been no realization there. And, but that's not really before the court at this point, and not going to worry about it. And frankly, if that mark to market it had to go away, that wouldn't be nearly as disruptive to the tax system as some of the other things involved. So I, I, I just suspect the court will make everybody unhappy, even if they rule for the Moors and say, hey, the 965 tax, yeah, you can get your money back, or at least individuals can get your money back. Uh, you know, to the extent anything you paid in the last two years, which because of the weird way that was done with installment payments is it looks like you've got a way to work with it. But uh, but otherwise, you know, leave open the issue. So until there is a wealth tax, we're not really going to argue about whether a wealth tax is or isn't constitutional. That's not our issue. Finally, this week, uh, the IRS, although it issued the draft forms much earlier, right? for Schedules K-2 and K-3 for 2023. And there weren't major changes from the... There were some minor ones. We discussed them earlier. There weren't major changes on the form, but that left open the question of, you know, where a lot of the big things we discussed quite a bit the last couple of years in the instructions, were there going to be any major changes for Schedule K-2 and K-3 on either Form 1065 or for the S Corporation, 1120S, regarding... Uh, the issue of the domestic filing exception, where we could get out of preparing a schedule K2 and K3 if, you know, we took certain steps, you know, and we had certain issues. Now, last year on the 22 returns, we could use domestic filing exception if A, we had only a limited subset of entity types, which pretty much meant no pass through entities except a single person as corporation. You know, one shareholder S corporation would be allowed, but otherwise you couldn't have a couldn't have an, another corporate partner type, and you couldn't have another uh, couldn't have a corporate partner type, nor could you have a partnership as a partner, you know, or shareholder. Of course, can't partners can't really be shareholders in S corporations. Not blowing S status, so that's there. Second issue was that you had to have total, you know, no no real foreign operations except for. At most, you know, only things like foreign dividends and interest things on 1099 DIV, 1099 INT, or that flowed to you on from another partnership or, you know, another entity, trust, whatever, that was of that type. And you didn't have credible foreign taxes of more than $300 in the partnership or S corporation. Um, you, you know, you notified people that the partnership or S Corp was not going to be provided, providing a K2, K3, and no partner or S Corp shareholder contacted you, you know, by the late, by the, er, by basically, by the date that was 30 days before the return was filed. And you were told you could actually put the notice out with the K1, which meant that literally you, you could, you know, give notice on the day the return was filed. 
that you weren't going to do this. So unless somebody got ahead of the game and realized you were likely to do this, and since you noticed without prompting, yeah, we had that issue. And of course, and we remember all the craziness for afterwards. That if somebody came back later and said they needed the data, you still had to provide it. And if anybody did that last year, then you're going to have to do at least a K3 for that person this year. Okay. The key question was, though, because that was radically different from what was true in 21, where we could have had partnerships as partners. There were some other issues there. So where are they going to change it again? And again, the question couldn't be answered until we saw this year's drafts. These draft chart instructions come out, and really, there are very, very few changes. They, they have changes that affect the couple of minor changes to the actual form itself. But the domestic filing exception is effectively the same as it was for 22 returns. And because of that, that means we have basically the same thing going on. As was true last year, as I've said, if you have that partnership that owns a single rental property in the U.S. with only U.S. partners, you have to seriously ask yourself if the domestic filing exception is worth the work, if your tax software will support, you know, checking a box, and it will just go ahead and pick up all the data and move it onto there and treat everything as U.S. source, uh, which most software did last year. I was told that ProSystem FX and Access did not have it done that way last year, no way to automate it. However, I have been informed on a couple of occasions now that, in fact, Access and ProSystem FX have reported that they will have that this year. So in which case, then, you got to ask yourself, is the simplest thing to do just issue everybody a schedule, everybody a K3, file the K2 with the return, and ignore domestic filing? I think we're going to see more of that. I know last year I clearly saw a number of partnerships where that was absolutely what the preparer made the decision to do, uh, was it was just easier to check a box and you're done. And yeah, we got a lot of printouts and yeah, the K1 packages are big, but since everybody's getting them electronically by PDFs, who cared, uh, versus going through and trying to jump through all the hoops to use domestic filing exception. But it does appear it will be the same for 22. You want to double check your tax software, see how they handle it. But looks like we're now kind of settling down. I don't think K2, K3, you know, it, it's going to be just a level of hassle that we've been used to the last couple of years. It's going to be basically the same thing this year. This has been the Current Federal Tax Developments for the week of December the 11th, 2023. Current Federal Tax Developments is brought to you by Kaplan Financial Education and by your state size CPAs. Uh, be sure to join us back here next week. We'll talk about other things that have happened in the area of tax. I do go ahead and hang around on the Connect forums for the Arizona, New Jersey, Minnesota, uh, Illinois, and Washington Society of CPAs, as well as keep an eye on discussion forums for the Idaho Society. So if, you, if you're a member of one of those societies, you have any questions, go ahead and post something there and I'll, I'll see about covering it. So we can talk about that at that point. I also do post updates on the Threads account that I run which is at Ed Zollers on threads. So if you want to go there, you can find that threads.net. Uh, so I do tend to post things I find there to get that up and running. So you can check in there. Otherwise, we'll be back here next week. See what's going on in the area of current federal tax developments.